when we were casting, all of a sudden, we started hearing noise coming from Ron's pocket. Looked at the meter, and we were measuring higher than usual radiation. He looks up, and he sees this thing lean out from behind a tree. And I looked down the hill. That was a humongous bipedal animal. This indicates that there's maybe four just in this little 10 mile area. Yeah. 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 Come here. My name is Beth Duncan. We're in Ravencliff, West Virginia. This land is a generational land. It's airship, actually, that our family is only allowed to be on or hunt or be around. Airship land is where, as long as my family continues to pay the taxes on the land, it will continue to be our land for as long as we pay on it. And we've got acres, I can't even remember how many acres, close to 70, I think, 70, 80 acres up in here. The area is most wooded, um, pine trees. Um, honestly, like, it's a, a vast amount of animals, deer, we've got black bear, we've got everything here. Like, it could sustain anything. Honestly, if it could sustain a, it's sustain a black bear, I mean, it could su sustain anything. Yeah, there's a few caves. Um, and there's also uh, mines where, abandoned mines actually, not on this land, but on, on land nearby that when they close the mines, you know, there's places underground, big holes underground that could be considered caves. Uh, you said, so it's a generational thing. Yeah. Did anyone uh, before you ever talk about anything unusual happening? Uh, my grandfather said something when I was little about seeing a bear walk on two, like walk for a while on two feet, but like I was so little and he died a long time ago, so it wouldn't be right of me to completely tell his story if, if you know, like there's stories of things. This is called Grau Hollow, by the way. This is what my ancestors have named this hollow. Like there's a lot of ghost stories and, and, and paranormal, like just things that happen here. Like there's generational things that's happened up here. Like this is a, a small little community, hush hush community, you never know like what's lurking around in these woods. You just don't like in a place like this, like it's a Bible Belt. This is right in the middle of the Bible Belt. People don't talk about these things. And you know, there's more, I guarantee there's more people that have seen this stuff and not even said a word to anybody about it. And I would say, I'd say it had a lot to do with it. Like my mom and them, they've seen, she won't, she won't talk about it. You know how they are, but she's seen some things up here. She thought at one point it was a, it was a cloaked figure with a little thing behind it following it. Like, strange stuff up through here and my mom like she's she's not a liar like 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 honestly we our family we take pride in like who we are and around here that's all you got we always like we wasn't allowed to go up in the woods a lot and one time when me and my family was up the hollow we had something and I was small we had something follow us from the top of the spring all the way down to here and my grandma was and it would stay in the wood line and she would say, don't run, don't run, whatever you do, don't run. And all I felt in my soul was to want to run. But, you know, I mean, we stayed calm till we got down here. And like you would, you would hear them talk about stories of things being up here. I mean, my mother had seen things and like paranormal things and, and just, it's, it's a very abnormal place to live actually. A young woman traveling by train from St. Louis to New York City woke up to the rolling mountains of West Virginia outside her window. It was unlike anything she had seen before, and in a moment of inspiration, she described the terrain as green hills of magic. Reflecting on the experience, she wrote, 
There was something mystical about it all, something supernatural. The woman's name was Ruth Ann Music, and in 1946 she would begin teaching at Fairmount State College in West Virginia and collecting the folk tales of the Mountain State. The stories she and her students recorded, almost exclusively from mining families, only confirmed her first impression of the region. The tales spoke of ghosts and giants, wandering corpses, leprechauns and wee people, magic objects, curses and witchcraft, werewolves, and the embodiment of evil itself in the form of a well-heeled gentleman. Immigrants from Europe and Asia Minor told of shrieking banshees, mystery birds portending certain death, biblical figures still walking the earth, unexplained disappearances of people in the prime of life, visits from dead loved ones and enemies, and anomalous lights weaving pathways through the woods. There was no doubt on the part of the professor that some of these wonders were holdovers from the old world, and some were told to offset the tedium and distract from the danger of a miner's life. But still others seemed less like cultural memory and more like an actual experience, with no moral of the story, no unseen forces balancing the scales of justice, simply a person scared senseless by something that shouldn't be there. About these, Dr. Music would write, the creatures in these stories are difficult to identify or explain. Sometimes they resemble real animals, but are never quite like them. One wonders how the professor would react to learning that in the 21st century, there would be groups of interested citizens investigating multiple phenomena simultaneously, not as folklore, but as fact. Start by telling me your name and uh, how, uh, you know, just give me your name. <laughs> I'm Joe Perdue. What is your um, research group called? Uh, the West Virginia High Strangeness Collective. We've been doing this since about 2017. We've all had interests in this prior to that, but the actual organization came together, organization officially came together in 2018, but Wild and Weird West Virginia was where it kind of started, and then the research division was born out of that. So I'm Ron Lanham. I am with the uh, West Virginia High Strangeness Collective. It's a little group that Wild and Weird West Virginia started up. It's kind of our research, it is our research uh, branch. About 35 years now. I've been into, uh, into, I guess, the subject of the just weird related phenomena in general. Of the sightings you've taken, and you mentioned Weinberry having other phenomena, how many involve, I guess, a high strangeness aspect? Is what I'm um, more than we're comfortable with, if I'm being completely honest. <laughs> because with the Bigfoot community, you have this yin and yang. You have a, a, a group that is wholeheartedly it is an ape in the woods and then you have a group that is wholeheartedly it is supernatural spiritual and then there's that thin line in the middle and that's where we like to camp out is because we there's so much other phenomena going on we do believe that there is some kind of undiscovered creature out here in the woods but we also believe there is some other things going on because we have too many reports we've also collected too much data that speaks to that and, and we can't dismiss it. You know, you, you can look the data dead in the eyes and tell it that it's wrong all you want, but it's not gonna change the fact that we recorded these, uh, these data points. It's not gonna change it. How often do reports you take involve like a high strangeness aspect? Uh, lately, quite a bit. And I think it's just because a lot of people know that we're open to that. We're okay with that. When I got started in this, it was chasing UFOs and ghosts. You know, I didn't, Bigfoot was the second, I believed it was there, but I never saw any proof until later. And, and now I still, I don't know what it is, but there's something there. But yeah, we do get quite a bit now. Of the reports you take, how many, if you can 
percentage it uh, do you think involve like a high strangeness aspect? With Bigfoot itself, there's just a small percentage where you were, you know, we've taken, they have the light, you see the light spheres, multiple different UFO things, right? Ghosts or, mm -hmm. um, you know, ghosts or ghost sightings. But normally we don't have like a ghost sighting, say with the UFO sighting or things like that. But when we say high, high strangeness, all of this stuff is strange. Well, do you guys feel like there's a connection between um, between Bigfoot and some of these other phenomena? I, land on I think they're all connected in some way. I think a lot of it is connected. Whether every single single thing is connected, I don't think. But I think a lot of it is connected. I mean, high strangeness. You know, John Keel. Everyone knows Keel. He talks about the ultra terrestrials, about this force, and how it all could be interconnected somehow maybe some malignant force that you know some some person seeing a ufo some person seeing a bigfoot you know sometimes people saying the same people can see something in the sky even and they're seeing different things i would say a lot of it is connected every single thing maybe not but a lot i do believe is somehow that i you know someone a lot smarter than me <laughs> would know believe me i mean um i do know that in, in some nationalities or whatever you want to call it, uh, like especially like there's a German lore that uh, Bigfoot is related to. It kind of follows with the lady in white and then there's like these lights that follow the lady in white and behind the, the, these lights are supposedly small hairy like creatures like Bigfoot but they're smaller not the huge you know things that we see here or, or other parts of the world. I've had a couple sightings of lights myself while doing Bigfoot investigations. Uh, one of them was actually in Randolph County I had interviewed a fella, and he was telling me about what he had experienced and what he saw. You know that, that he he didn't want to say it was Bigfoot, but he said there's nothing else he can you know say it was. And as I'm sitting in the field next to his property, I see a little white light that just floats along and disappears, and then floats along again. And then I interviewed the neighboring landowner, and I was talking to him. I asked him if you ever seen any lights in relation to the sounds and stuff they were hearing there. And he said, no, they've never seen the lights. And then he called me a couple days later. He said, I didn't, you know, I didn't see any lights, but I would like to tell you that I did have something strange happen in the same area that you saw the lights. He said, my brother and I were working on the fence, the fence line there, and he looks up and looks up to where there's a cabin. And he sees this thing lean out from behind the tree and then lean, lean back. And I said, was it Bigfoot, uh, a Bigfoot? He's like, I don't know. He said, it was just black. I'm almost reminding like of a you know, more of a shadow type thing you know, as far as what he could see. He said, he had, I, and he told me, he said, I just kept eye on that tree and nothing moved. He said, then a few minutes later, on the other side of the cabin, the same thing leans out from behind another tree and back and hit. he said it never went from tree to tree. He, he would have saw it. So, so yeah, I, there might be some connections, whether it's connection with Bigfoot or something else that may be construed as Bigfoot, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, how many reports have you taken that actually involve other phenomena associated with the Bigfoot sighting? So mystery lights, orbs, whatever, in, in connection with the uh, Bigfoot. Any, you know, like how often do you take them where they actually have a high strangeness? Not once. I mean, my experience has been that the guys that are open-minded about the woo aspect of Bigfoot are usually the ones that get the woo aspect Bigfoot reports. I'll write down anything that anyone tells me. I mean, after we leave here today, I have two witnesses. I have to make phone calls and take their stories today. And if one of them tells me something, I'll document everything is because you know, we just don't know yet. But as many years of I've been in the woods at night with my running my traps, running my dogs, doing the Bigfoot thing, I have never just had anything like that happen to me. And many of my good friends are very interested in it. I've been in the woods with people that, you know, they'll say, hey, there's one right in front of you and I've had that happen and I'm standing there with a thermal and there's nothing in front of me. Uh, we were at, at Salt Fork State Park during one of the conferences, okay, and there were some of our members, this was after the conference, some of our members were at the handicap shelter. So me and Terry were in one car and Dave Rupert was in the other car and we pulled up outside of the uh, of the shelter and we got out of the car me and terry got out of the car and dave got out of his car and immediately when we got out of the car 
we, we were hit. And I, I want to say it was almost like she says, it was almost like we were hit with a wall. We all looked at each other and said, something is Something's off. Up. And like it was dead happened. silence in the woods. And our group was sitting under the shelter and they were just all sitting there quiet. But the whole, like there was no nature sounds whatsoever. And the, and the first thing that those, what did they say? Remember what they said? No. They said, some, we had just gone up to them. Okay, we didn't say anything. They said, something's off tonight. Something's not right. They all felt it before we even got there. So Dave and I and went back And it lasted to, yeah. about 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And Dave and I walked and we got, our, we got our gear. We had night vision. We had a parabolic mic. We walked up and down the road. We saw nothing. We smelled nothing. But man, we felt something. We felt something. It was so powerful and intense is the word. Intense is about the best word, word mm -hmm. we can use. After about like maybe 20 minutes or so, we walked back over to where the rest of our members were. And it was like somebody flipped a switch off because all of a sudden we started hearing sounds and, and you went. It was like something lifted and every, the air was light again. You went, wow, okay, we can breathe now. I mean, I, I tell you, and we're not usually, that's only happened uh, to a lesser extent one other time in Venango County when a two mile run when we walked into an area on a trail on the back of the lake and uh, myself and our friend uh, Leah who's, who's psychic we both stopped at the same time and we looked up and we looked at each other and we, we said something's here right and she said yeah she felt it too it was like off to our left and it happened for a little while right and then it seemed to dissipate but uh, sometimes you can feel this thing whether it's infrasound or if you just can feel somebody's watching I took a report I, I can't remember exactly what there's a couple I took but I can't remember exactly where this one was at the gentleman told me that he seen this thing coming it was kind of like in the residential area and he seen this thing coming along the road from to his right but before he seen it his car quit his car shut off and he could hear this humming noise and then the, then the street light shuts off. And then he sees this thing coming along the road, off the grass, comes up on the road. And the, the entire time he could hear, and he said he could hear, but also feel like this vibration, like a humming vibration. And the, the creature, Bigfoot-like creature, walks to the other side of the road, walks off the road, and there's a wood line. And before it gets to the wood line, it just basically vanishes. It didn't like walk into the wood line, it just vanished. And he said after it vanished, here was, uh, you know, the, the, his car was able to start, the street light come back on, he didn't hear the noise anymore. And then you hear other stories where, where folks are, before they see this creature, you know, whatever, you know, Bigfoot or whatever you want to call it, they hear cracking, popping, buzzing sounds, you know, in, I mean, if they're in the woods and all of a sudden they see them. So, so that could be related to like high EMF and stuff, you know, why it's there. I'm not sure. This was actually the first place that we collected high strangeness data points in a Bigfoot report. Um, the report started that they saw this large black figure run across a trail and ran down through the valley, made all kinds of noise, and then just was gone. We were here within two hours of the report because we live in close proximity to this area. And when we got on site, Ron had packed his pocket Geiger counter. And we find the, the trackway area. We find where something had been. I'm a trained tracker. I teach tracking classes, so we were able to recognize where these footprints were moving. And we found four footprints. We cast three of the four. We found some, some tracks uh, that, that are worth taking a cast of. And uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and pour them and see what comes out of the ground. When we were casting them, all of a sudden, we started hearing noise coming from Ron's pocket. There it is. Yep. So the weird thing is we're reading 36 CPM. And the average should be 17. And our tracks are right there. Looked at the meter and we were measuring higher than usual radiation. And so we're getting low, low grade radiation spikes, abnormal for this area. So far we pulled a few and might pour a couple more. Um, there's definitely enough. Uh, it's a real high traffic area. Yeah, it is. And uh, it's heavily trafficked. 
you know and and on the weird side i have to put it in there because yeah. it happened and it was on the advice of a very notable researcher it was it was so uh stan gordon really said weird. to uh you know take uh radiological uh readings so we brought the geiger counter and we're supposed to have a 17 cpm background yeah that's what it point. is over in the other part of this uh valley all, and all over, over here. here it's not it's uh, 36 cpm right now which is weird is weird so i don't know maybe nothing maybe something but we documented it and that's what we do in general this region the whole state of west virginia is going to set around 17 to 23. we were getting spikes to 40 42. and so it was double the ambient natural radiation so something happened there and we were detecting the residual radiation only in that spot 10 feet away nothing everything was quiet but as soon as you started getting close to where these footprints were suddenly the geiger counter started going off we had a similar event take place at wineberry we were actually out there filming and we, we were able to collect all this data on film um we were looking into a, in a new area out there uh that, that beth had had some uh stuff happen or had heard some things and the radiation the ambient radiation in the area doubled immediately and it dropped off just as quick as it came we heard Is that the power? power just went out later that night the power came back on after joe's interview was completed Whether coincidence or otherwise, it's something Joe and Ron have almost come to expect and have learned to take in stride as part of their investigations, namely, the intrusion of seemingly unrelated phenomena. To hear them tell it, strange things happen to them quite often when they're out in the woods. For many people, a run-in with Sasquatch would leave them shaken enough the introduction of other anomalies would be a step too far, causing them to question their own perception and perhaps their own sanity. But for some experienced researchers like Ron and Joe, reports of multiple oddities being observed simultaneously are part of an emerging pattern, a pattern many are reluctant to discuss. Nevertheless, the history of documented Bigfoot sightings includes accounts with extremely weird details. The stories challenge common notions of what is possible, testing the boundaries of even the most open-minded among us. With tales of a footprint track line coming to an abrupt end in the middle of an open field, a Sasquatch holding a ball of light or transforming into a luminous orb, and even the commingling of hairy hominids and UFOs in the same location. It should be noted that some who examine reports, like Russ Jones, for example, claim to have never taken an account with paranormal elements, while others, like Ron and Joe, hear them somewhat regularly in a manner reminiscent of researcher Stan Gordon, whose written work stands as a catalog of inexplicable encounters in southwest Pennsylvania. While enthusiasts of the unexplained debate the plausibility of such happenings, people keep seeing and hearing things they can't comprehend. Acknowledging how ridiculous it all seems, they reach out to those like Joe and Ron in hopes of being taken seriously, or at least not laughed at. And sometimes, the alliance of witness and investigator can bear some unlikely fruit. My ex was in prison and you know coming from where i'm a military background like that kind of stuff gets to me like really deeply about like prison and and, and of course my family around here they didn't want me with somebody in prison i was 
cry and I said you know what I can't let my kids see this my older daughter like she was 18 at the time and I told her I said can you please watch the little kids and let me just go up in the mountains I need a break I need to breathe I need to scream because you go up here you can scream and nobody's gonna hear you and that's what I needed at the moment <laughs> it still gets me when I talk about it um got to the top of the mountain and there was a rock right by the telephone pole because there's a big telephone pole up there and there was a rock that sat right by the telephone pole and I sit on that rock and I was screaming at the top of my lungs and yelling and like just as much as I could let out and I heard this like it was like a uh, noise to the let's see you left of me right and I looked down the hill and there was a humongous bipedal animal standing right there and I didn't know what to do and it was like I seen him and he was like ducking he had his one hand on a tree he was ducking like like kind of like this you know like kind of checking me out now maybe it was because I was screaming like I don't know what why that it was there like that but and he was just ducking and looking at me or she I don't know which it was but it was dark brown like but when the it, it was a sunny day and it had like a when the sun hit it like a, a like a burgundy like a reddish color to it and like you could see like the wind blowing its fur like under its arms and like just it its face like it had human characteristics its nose like like and this is the way I described it to Joe and then when we first talked it was like a treasure troll nose like a like a troll nose like but and its mouth was like you could see a little slit in its mouth I couldn't see its teeth or anything but you could see like the little the, the mouth the mouth was like thick mouth it had like this hump on its head right through here. Very tall, its arms hung down longer than they should on a human. Very hefty, he was a hefty boy or girl, I don't know which one, but very big. I think we measured on a tree up here, seven and a half feet tall. Very, in my eyes now that I look back beautiful, honestly, like this creature. I remember looking at this thing's face and it wasn't far from me. And like the, you could almost like see human emotion. Like it was just like a, you can almost see it, like it was unreal. It was unreal. And when I locked eyes with this thing, it was almost like, and I know this sounds crazy, but like I lost like every sense of everything. And it was, I was just locked face to face with this, whatever it was, about Bigfoot, I guess, I just locked face to face with it. And it felt like forever, but I'm sure it was a couple of seconds. I, I mean, I broke free of whatever feeling that was, and I had a choice to make. I could run down the mountain, which that meant I would have to pass it. Or it meant running back up into the mountains where I'd have a chance of meeting whatever's up there. So I had to run down that hill. And it took me like two or three minutes, like, and it just stood there rocking, looking. And so I started, I, I got up enough nerve and I started running down this mountain. There's a trail that goes from the top of the graveyard down the side of that mountain, down to my house. And I took a run as fast as I could. And, and it was crazy because I even looked back. It didn't even take off after me. It just started walking like nothing never happened. Like, it, oh, well, it, psh, nothing to it, you know. But to me, this was the, I'm shaking right now, like a life-changing experience. Like, honestly, it was crazy. But, but the time that I got halfway down this mountain, like my legs were like, I was trying to run and they were so weak that it was almost giving out on me. And I got down here to the bottom and I peed on myself. I ain't gonna lie about any of it. Like I have no reason to. And now that I think back, like it wasn't even trying to hurt me. That's why, you know, when Joe and them come up here and, and we did this investigation, they talked me through the things that had happened. And he said, you know, you sure it wasn't more curious? And I'm like, you know, you're right. Like it was, that's, Basically, all it was doing was checking me out, and here I was running down the hill pee on myself. Like, does that, it don't make sense right now, but at that moment, you're told your whole life, none of this exists. Like, nothing, no, no, no cryptid existed, and then you run into something like that. The only thing your body and mind can do is think to run. It's, it's unlike anything that I've ever been through. Yeah, this place has been in my family longer than two generations. Um, we just, my great-great-grandparents decided that they would buy the land airship that way and they wouldn't get, ever fight or get rid of the land. So it's older than 
two different generations. My grandmother said she found airheads in this land. So no telling, like, Indians could have inhabited here too. I don't know why they built it up here, like that, right next to a graveyard. And my dad put me right there, 10 feet for 15 feet from a grave, a little boy that burnt. I used to hear all kind of stuff in that house. Scary what? stuff, like noises you hear at night as a little kid. But I can't rule out anything either until I see it with my eyes. But that was like, it was scary living there. And especially being like in, uh, in high school or pre-high school and looking out your window and seeing a graveyard in, in the middle of nowhere. Like imagine, like, I don't know why they did me like that. I was a little bit dirty, wasn't I? The thing is, she turned out to be and is an incredible beginner researcher at this point. We, we went up, we taught her how to do casts. She's managed to pull cast out of the area. She knows what she's looking for. She's taking detailed records. She's keeping notes. And she's just completely turned around uh, from this person who was terrified of going to the woods into someone who is now actively out there looking for this thing. We were at Wineberry and we we're out there just doing a visitation to the site and documenting everything we do. Um, we try to take cameras with us for everything just so that way we can document when these weird anomalies could occur, if they do, because they don't happen all the time. While we were there doing our research, we stopped and we were just listening. We were doing a recording session because um, we we're in an area that we had had vocal activity before. Camera. So we're in that same location and we're just sitting there listening. And uh, so we started the audio recorder up, we had, uh, and Ron went ahead and set out all of our detection devices. And the wind started to blow. We were there for maybe five or 10 minutes. The wind began to blow and uh, we heard this mouth clicking that was going on. And just like uh, when you click your tongue in your mouth, but it was doing it really fast. And then all of a sudden, the Geiger counter starts going off the area doubles in uh, ambient radiation again. Then as soon as the chirping and clicking stops, radiation goes back to standard, goes back to normal. We sit there and this happens three times. It was repeatable. We would hear this clicking and then the chirping would start from the Geiger counter. Then uh, the second time there was no wind, but we had mouth clicking and radiation spike. Then the third time, we had wind again, clicking, and the chirping from the Geiger counter. We also got readings on the millimeter and on our uh, EMF detector. Yeah, Wineberry is definitely the, the I think the best Bigfoot sighting that uh, we've documented just because of the sheer volume of data that is coming out of the site. What have the tracks look, look like? Um, they're five toes. The, fir the, point, the first toe, and this one that, that, that I got, is, is he has like this pointy toe. Like it's weird because I, we call him Waldo up here because like he's only been seen a couple times. You know, where's Waldo? We'll go up, I'll come up here and I'll lay my um, gifts out. And I'll say, where you at Waldo? It's got pointed toe, five toes, they're about anywhere from 15, tw well, that one is 12 inches. I take that back, 12 to, what was Joe, jo 19 inches, 17 inches? There's some big boys, and they're, I think, like seven and a half inches wide. So Beth has pulled these these four, and this was the original Wineberry cast uh, that kind of started us all up here. And um, that's a copy of it uh, that we brought up here to give to Beth. And uh, what, what we're looking at is these two were pulled from the same holler very close to one another two years apart and we're seeing the landmarks the same landmarks with the toes in the same places and the toes are the same shape too which is which is really good because uh, it indicates that we've got the same creature that's actually returning and coming back here um, but then there's more you know these came from just up the road about four or five miles away and we've got a really, really nice size right foot and a really a good size left foot too. But you've got two different sized creatures on this one. Plus you've got the ones that are coming from right here in this holler, these three. And we're, we're looking at a very 
pretty compact area um, when you're talking about just square mileage. And uh, we've got multiple multiple creatures. Um, I, I think it's impressive. It's, you could have a family group. There could be a family group or, or maybe a, uh, a couple, yeah. uh, just a couple different yeah. creatures. Um, it, it's hard to speculate on that. Sure. I mean, it'd be, I'd love to say there was a family group. But um, you can... This indicates yeah. that there's there's definitely Multiple. at least three, yeah. at least three, maybe four, just in this little ten mile area. Okay. These these came from Twin Falls, correct? Mm -hmm. So both of the these two came from Twin Falls, and we're dealing with obviously two well, we two we'll different individuals mm -hmm. here. Uh, then these three all came from right here in this uh, where we're going to be at tonight, where we'll be looking at, and I'm going to take you guys. Um, and it, the shape of the toes, you know, when we first pulled this track, we saw the shape of the toes and they were very distinct. And, uh, a few months back when, when Beth shot me a picture of this track, uh, the toe was the first thing that screamed at me. I was like, that's, that's the same big toe. Those are the same feet that made the tracks that we cast up here three years ago. And, uh, it's, it's really cool to see that now. The best thing about Wineberry was when we found that cast. And uh, I still remember when we, we found that cast and Joe's pouring it, and it was the longest 40 minutes that I've ever sat in a, in a cab waiting for a plaster cast to dry because we didn't know. We just thought it was, it, it looks good, you know. We're gonna pour it, see what it is. And I kept saying, it's gotta have toes. It's just gotta have toes or I'm not gonna be convinced. Pull that thing out of the ground and the very first thing you see is that big toe and it's like, oh my goodness. She had seen things somewhere near there, and it was just perfect. We had seen ground impressions in these other areas, but in this one spot, there were some, uh, as I recall, some ground cherries in uh, all around this. There were some dead uh, ground cherries in this area, which was a perfect food source. And he just started looking, and he found some impressions, and then on up the, a little bit further up, you know, there's this, there's this little wet, perfect wet area and there it is. You can see the picture of it. There's a little bit of water in it, and it looks like toes. And it's just like I'm trying not to get excited. And, um, you know, I don't want to be let down. And then 40 minutes later, pulled out of the ground. There it is. Is there a particular time that there seems to be more activity? In the mornings and in the evenings, like, like at night. When it's getting dark and up till about 10 o'clock, and then in the mornings, my aunt, that's when she heard the the tree knocks is about eight o'clock in the morning. But now um, in the evenings, just about like now, when it's about to get dark and then up till about nine or 10 o'clock. Yeah, and no, I think it's probably the first time anything like that would be. Yeah, like that, they, they probably, I don't know. Like they, hey Ron, I'm firing up audio. Where, okay. Where it's, it's private and nobody's that loud up here at nighttime like that. It's, it's going to be interesting, like, you know, to see if they just stay quiet or if they yeah. make themselves known. Like, shooting her area there. It's going to be real interesting. I want to get that. This is where we found the tracks at. There's been two sets of tracks found um, within 100 yards of each other here. This is also where we've had uh, some other anomalous activity take place that we've recorded. And we're going to uh, go back out that way and uh, see what happens. What kind of anomalous? Um, strange radiation spikes, uh, as well as some off the wall EMF spikes that were unusual for where we were at, because um, we were not underneath power lines at that point. We were actually out deep in uh, next to a spring and there was no reason for it. So uh, we, we definitely took note of that and added it to the data set. Yeah, we haven't been back since then, so this will be the first time out here since then. And, uh, you know, we've had a, a way of kind of rethinking some of this stuff after uh, after that happened. So just want to go so? back out and check it. How so? I didn't really pay that much attention to that kind of stuff at first, to be honest. And then later on, it's like it just kept showing up. First with Kanoa State, then out here, and it's like, you can't just keep ignoring it, pretty much what it comes down to. But uh, it's back in there, and that's where we're going to be heading.
one, one of the things that we like to do uh, when we go out into the field, um, we, we document everything, whether it is some kind of Bigfoot activity, uh, strange anomalous activity, or perfectly natural. And one of these perfectly natural things that also happens to be a very quick, very easy food source is right here beside of us. And uh, we're looking at these clusters of wood frog eggs. Now, these start showing up as early as mid-February. Wood frogs will come out as soon as we start getting temperatures above 40 degrees. Uh, they're going to start coming out and they're going to begin breeding. And they lay these large, large clusters of eggs. You can see right here, we're not in very, very deep water, but you know, these clusters are about the size of my hand. And these are easy to scoop up and eat. You've got easy facts easy protein right there. Yeah, do you remember this is where we found them that first time we came up and we yep. found the cast as well. Was that print was in this area. They were full of the same thing. And we had uh, ground cherries, as I recall. We did. So, and I saw a few of those already. The scariest thing that happened to me while we were out in the woods was we were out looking for Bigfoot. We were doing, doing a, a, a field, well, we were out here actually, and here in Canal State Forest. And we heard a loud, loud, loud wood knock. It was a big, loud pop. It was really close proximity. And then when we started making our way farther down that road, there was a big, bright white ball of light at about six feet off the ground. We thought it was somebody with a headlamp. And suddenly it took an immediate left-hand turn and went over the hillside. And that hillside is not traversable. Um, it, it's straight down almost for about a thousand feet. It, it's a very, very, very steep incline. It's not something that any, anybody we were with would have tried to even make a joke with. And uh, it, it, that was unnerving because that was my first encounter with seeing the, uh, the weird light phenomena out in the woods. And I cannot explain what it was or why it was there, um, but it, it was really unnerving. Is there anything else anomalous about the Oh, right. yeah, there's orbs. Um, the other day, <laughs> this was weird because I, I messaged Joe, I was scared to death. I was up here just at nighttime, dry, you know, we, me and my friend Rachel, we was driving up here. And the night before we had seen these red, or I thought they were eye, like eye shine is what I thought they were. And we pulled up to the top of the actual landing on up here. And we was getting ready to turn around. I was like, I said, Rachel, no, Rachel told me, she's like, do you see that light up in the sky? I was like, oh wait, I do see that. And I was like, Rachel, that's on the side of the mountain. That's not in the sky. No, wait, we seen it up at the graveyard. Then we come back down to the first landing and she said, it's right there. So I said, hold on, let me get out of the car and look at it. And when I got out of the car, they was these other little, underneath this thing about, I, I don't know how far it was up in the air, but it was these like red orbs. And they were like, it looked like these lights were like just floating on a wave and bio, bio illuminating. Like it was the weirdest thing that I ever seen. And they were about the size of, I would say, because I went back up there and I told Rachel, I was like, how far was I? We measured it out. And I took a golf ball up there. So they were about the size of a golf ball, about it. And, but they were red. And they were just um, doing some weird stuff, dancing or whatever they were doing. But I sent them the video. I was scared to death. I said, Rachel, get back in the car. And she, was, she didn't see it. She was taking her time. I said, get in, turn around, let's go. Like, that scared me probably worse than this up here. And I think because I could almost feel the intention, like of, it wasn't gonna attack me, but this, I didn't know what this was. Like, I still don't. I won't go back up here at night anymore. Like, I used to all the time, not after that. It's been said that one should not attempt to explain a mystery by using another mystery. 
But what happens when more than one mystery presents itself at the same time? That's the uncomfortable position in which some Bigfoot eyewitnesses have found themselves, when they've come face to face with multiple oddities at once. Mentioning any one of these threatens to strain credulity to the breaking point. But those who dare to relate experiences of compound strangeness run many social risks. So what does one do with the childhood memory of a Sasquatch wearing an old weather-beaten shirt? That might sound quaint compared to the feeling of being paralyzed and spoken to in telepathic fashion by a hair-covered forest dweller. Numerous reports exist of Bigfoot that dematerialize in plain sight of an eyewitness, or exhibit a cloaking ability that compares to a famous science fiction film character. There are the cases that stretch the limits of reason. Combinations of UFOs and Bigfoot in close proximity. Accounts involving multiple eyewitnesses and police investigations that suggest undreamt of connections between phenomena. No less fantastic are a growing body of anecdotes describing a direct relationship between Bigfoot and glowing spheres and flashes of light in wooded areas, implying that one can and does become the other. Such stories are easy to dismiss. After all, one shouldn't explain a mystery with another mystery. And most people do dismiss them. Unless you've seen such things with your own eyes. And as it happens, both UFOs and orbs have been glimpsed on Beth's property in Wineberry, West Virginia. Seems like a good place to look. Cause there's some grass like foliage down there. Something now, oh, oh, there. well, hey, we're at the spot where that thing ran. Are we? Yeah. Yes, there you go. I know. That's why I said, shine it down there, see if anything like popped out. But. Yeah. Yeah, let's just sit here and listen. We'll yeah, that's what I'm thinking. You want to go lights out here? Yeah. Go lights out here. We're more passive, I guess, in our research tactics, especially with doing nighttime investigations. We're not the type that will go out and just start beating on trees and, and whooping and screaming into the night. Uh, it. We found that it seems to... Um, work better and you get you get some better results when you're just kind of hanging out and um, being quiet and listening but seriously I don't see anything in that ridge at all no there's I don't see anything I don't see foot like traffic or there's anything here this is uh this is big footing really is. <laughs> really you know you go out and you set and, and you be quiet. A lot of the times, you know, we um, we don't really do a whole lot of night ops, you know? It was. So, it was, we came in, it went out. Listen. 
not hurt anymore. What was it? I didn't think it. It sounded like a psh, psh, psh. Yeah. You heard it too, Eli? Something, it sounded like something was moving through the leaves. Mm -hmm. But kind of trying to keep quiet. Or... It wasn't too far. It's... It wasn't that. This general area? It was, it, there was one there and then one here. I didn't see the first one. Well, I saw one just down there. Yeah. Like I'm seeing them every once in a while, they'll just Where? spark up. Where I don't know what it? that is. That was weird, wasn't it? Could that be a machine? I mean, I've had this on. Yeah, no, I was watching your phone. Okay. So you're pointing that which way? I'm pointing it behind me. And I'm watching it on Ron's phone. Go back, go back, go back, down, 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 go down. Off to, yeah, off to your left, go up. If they're feeling by me, I am not want them out of me. Yeah, there was something moving. It didn't sound yeah, very did big. did you see it? I've been hearing something behind me. I've been telling you all this stuff behind me. Pan your left. Slow. I go right. Love. Stop. What is that? Hang on. Go back, Joe. Keep going. Go on, stop. What we got right there in that tree? Is that just a hot spot? I think so. Down. Up. Yeah, right in there. That's just a hot spot. Okay. It's not going to be that easy. What do you think it is a physical creature? Which I think we're dealing with. I think we're dealing with two things. I really do. Um, I used to think that there was this one thing, and I did think it was a paranormal type aspect to this thing. But the more people I talk to, the more I kind of think we are dealing with two separate things, or either we're dealing with we're either dealing with two separate things, or we are dealing with a mimic. We're dealing with something that is trying to mimic something that was here before. That's a possibility. Elaborate on that. What mimic? Something that is trying to mimic the behavior of or the appearance of something that was here before. There's, there are these old legends that say, you know, that Bigfoot, you know, was here, right? So we have the native legends. We have the first people's legends. What if it was? What if this was pretty much their home? This is before, you know, humanity basically came in and, and started settling and, and kind of driving them out. Well, what if something else was here? And it kind of saw those and said, hey, that's, that's what they are. That's what, we're, gonna, we're gonna emulate that so they're not afraid of us. And maybe they never got the message that, you know, you know we are afraid of that, so. <laughs> I'm just gonna say an intelligence because I know a lot of people want me to say the A word, but it's an intelligence. I don't know what it is any more than anyone else does. Uh, we just know that there's, there's evidence that there's something there that is intelligent and it does seem to have the ability to make you see what it wants you to see. So is it beyond a, a reasonable doubt that you know, some of these, these sightings aren't exactly what you're seeing? I think that's absolutely a possibility. There is more than one thing happening in the woods, that there is some sort of phenomena that is taking place that is what I call Bigfoot-like because our lexicon is broken. And I think that's the biggest miscommunication in the Bigfoot community is that the lexicon is broke. We, we, de we deem all these things woo, but they're not woo. Woo cannot be detected on scientific instrumentation. So something's happening. Something real is happening. And it might be Bigfoot related, but we're not seeing Bigfoot. We're having these encounters that seem Bigfoot-like, which is why we kind of deem them it's a Bigfoot-like activity, um, because we had the mouth clicks followed up by radiation. But we didn't see anything. 
So we can't say whether it was Bigfoot or if this was some other kind of weird phenomena that was just taking place. We just happened to be there to catch. Because we've often found that when we're looking for subject A, subject B will rear its head. And if you're not prepared, you're not going to have any way to collect data on it. So we just go out with everything we've got. Now, back to the theory. I think that there's a possibility of a connection between all of the Native American lore and about how Sasquatch can walk between planes of existence and what we're experiencing. Because if you have something that can transition from one plane of existence to the next, or it, to use the more common terminology, dimensions, something that can transition from this dimension to an, the next, then you're going to have something happen in that immediate area. There will be physical ramifications. It's just, you, you cannot displace matter like that and not expect there to be some kind of reaction in the environment. After I told Joe and them, like, I don't care if people think I'm crazy or not. Like, this is a flesh and blood being that needs protected. Like, if I don't speak up, maybe, maybe I need to be that voice or anybody that, is a part of this needs to be that voice and say, you know, they are here and they do need to be protected. And we don't need to think of them as just, as just a Bigfoot, like they're an animal, they're a creature. There's something that needs to be protected. I think it's flesh and blood, I do. Now this other stuff that's happening up here, like to, to say that it doesn't have some higher, I don't know, like, I don't even want to say that. That sounds funny, but it sounded funny me even telling the story about what I saw, you know, like what could this stuff be? I mean. Anybody that's ever like tried to come up here at night time, it gets ominous. Like you, I guarantee if you're up here tonight and you try to walk up here, you're gonna feel it. Like it's, it's a feeling that, I got chills all up, the, up my arms. Like it's a feeling like you're being watched. You're not supposed to be there and get out at the same time. Like it's just, it's ominous. Yeah, that gave me chills just talking about it. Hey, Seth. Yeah. Yeah. Come here. That's a good one. This is why you always stop at the mud holes. Wow. I've got about an eight inch footprint. It's old, about probably before the last rain. Can you point it out, uh, the toes? The big toes here, the ball of the foot would be here. Come back, you've got a wide heel, so it's not a bear. And uh, if it was a bear, I mean, you can see the deer hooves right there very easily. Um, we have some toe sliding right here in the clay where it's a little bit more dry. Um, then, but right here, you can see the, the water fills it in, but it's, uh, it's really old. I mean, this was, this is, like I said, probably before the last rain. And there was a step with a little bit of a slide in it. It's a small foot, like I said, only... Only about eight inches. So now we stop and we look all around this to see if we can find the other that's right there. Where? Yeah. Right there. Apparently certain. Let me get over here. Uh, that's indiscernible from the other side. It looks like a foot. And what's so, this? Is this? Well, I'll come look at that in just a second. <laughs> um, uh, so it was moving that way. That way. So it must have come. So out. there's got to be. I mean, this could be it. It's just it's so. It was a while it. back. So. Yeah, it's old. It's, it's several days old. It should be right in here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right oh, oh yeah, that, that kind of right. looks like yeah. a toe. That's a sh yeah. pointy big toe. There's a pointy toe, uh, just like the ones we've. I can see it. Maybe a bear. Let me see. There's the toe. Um, so there we go. Could be here. a bear. So let's see. That is yeah. a. So we've got a heel impression here, mm -hmm. and toes right here. If you want to, you can come around my way. You might want to shoot over my left shoulder. So there's a heel impression here, Ron. If you sweep in there, there's heel. Right We're going up the side of the foot. We're in that same same size, and we've got in the mud right here. There's a toe. We lose the other toes here because the leaves and a tapeworm. <laughs> um, 
So right here. But that was another foot. So there's mm -hmm. there's tracks. Yeah. Wait, Eli, point again. It's a nice. It's pretty Big nice. toe. Mm -hmm. Heel in the back. I mean, look somewhere how pointy here. that is, Joe. That's a pointy toe. So right here's your toe. Is that what you're saying? Well, there's a, yeah. with this one. There's a lot of slide. It'd be hard to tell. Oh, oh. yeah. Encountering the unexplained can have a profound impact on witnesses. The experience may cause them to shift their perspective on what constitutes the real world. Some families may feel so threatened that they move away. Others take a defensive stand in an elemental battle to guard house and home. Still others process their brush with the unknown by engaging in a creative pursuit using the arts to express their emotions. And some channel their energy into a quest, a quest for knowledge about what happened to them, a quest for truth that compels them to risk ridicule and reputation to reach out to those who might provide guidance. That same quest for insight drives investigators to receive reports, conduct interviews, and spend precious time and whatever resources are at their disposal in an attempt to piece together a complex puzzle. Very often, they're also driven by the simple desire to help another person in need, to share in their bewilderment and give whatever support they can, and to seek whatever answers are available, to consider all the possibilities in each case even the most uncomfortable ones, the ones that involve dishonesty or misidentification or a disordered mind, or the ones that suggest a sincere, trustworthy person has come close to objects or entities outside of normal perception. And not to stop there, but to gather whatever evidence may be left, to examine patterns to test natural explanations, to see if there's any way to make the pieces fit, to see if even an edge of the puzzle can be assembled. One thing's for sure, West Virginia's Green Hills don't give up their secrets too readily, as if an old magic is still at work. Among the mountains, the mysteries endure and so does the quest.